So you've got this vector A. It says it's six long. It doesn't tell you any units. It doesn't matter. You don't care. You don't know. And then there's B that's pointing down here somewhere. And this one is uh, 4.51 units long. These are both vectors, although it just tells you the scalar quantity. But the fact that you know that there's an arrow there with an angle on it, you know everything you need to know. 55. Seventy-three, and you can break these down into x and y, which is what you do every time you have a crooked vector. Break them down x and y. So this would be a x, this would be a y, and this would be. I'm not a very good artist. Let's see. This would be b y and b x, and make sure you get your arrows in the right direction. And uh, <clears throat> so then you just got to use Sokotoa to find out each part. So you just got to find this part, this part, all four of those parts that I drew in red there. And so this is the adjacent. That's the hypotenuse. There's your angle. So you're going to use the cosine function. So A, I'll just write it out once here, but there's four of these. Cosine 55 is equal to adjacent. AX over the hypotenuse, which is 6. So you multiply the 6 up here. So now you have AX is 6 cosine 55, which is um, 3.44. And then AY is 6 sine 55, and that's 4.91. So this side here is 3.44. This side here is 4.91. Then we'll do the same thing over here. Bx, that's this one up here. That's the adjacent. <coughs> so we're going to use cosine again. So Bx is going to be 4.51 times the cosine of 73.2. And that answer is 1.30. Positive or negative? Why? Going to the left, so this one gets a negative sign. By is 4.51 sine 73.2, and that answer is uh, 4.32, and that's also negative because it's going down. And now um, that's all stuff that you've done before, back in high school or trig or whatever. But now, to write this in the vector notation for this class, here's the way you write this. You just grab the x piece, and you say the vector a can be written as 3.44 i hat plus 4.91 j hat. That's it. You just write your x piece in front of the i hat, your y piece in front of the j hat. And that, that's how you write it in vector form. That's all there is to it. And, and if you remember what vector means, it means amount and direction. And this format gives you all that information. It gives you the amount and the direction. It tells you how far over and how far up. So it already assumes over and up. And by telling you each piece, it gives you this piece and this piece. So you can get anything you need after that. It's just it's already broken down for you. So then vector b <coughs> would be negative 1.30 i hat minus 4.32 j hat. And OK, so that's part a. And then part b says uh, find a minus b. So we want to take this vector and subtract that ve vector. And this is it's just, when you once you have it written in this vector format, it's oh so easy. That's what's nice about this format is the math in this format is nice, which is why we use it. And so you're just going to subtract them. I mean, it's just flat out subtraction. It's 3 
3.44 i hat plus 4.91 j hat, that's a, and then we're going to subtract negative 1.30 i hat minus 4.32 j hat, subtract the i hat from the i hat and the j hat from the j hat. Don't forget the minus sign out here has to go in there and there. It's got to be, you just follow regular rules of algebra here. So when you do that subtraction, you get, um, it ends up being addition because it's minus a minus, but it's, it is a subtraction problem fundamentally. Um, so the answer here is uh, 4.74 plus 9.23 J hat. Okay, how y'all doing? Any questions? We could do like jumping jacks or something to help wake up, if that helps. I didn't bring enough coffee for everybody. That might be easier than jumping jacks, but... Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, where did I put points? Let's see. I gave you, uh, on, the, on the A hat vector, I gave you one point for the 3.44, one point for the 4.99 or 91 and one point for the general format and uh, same thing on B one point one point and then one point for the format and then that one point has to encompass that that minus sign goes with it and then uh, for the subtraction uh, making the realization that the negative and the other negative ends up being addition. That was worth one point. So just so long as you realize that in some format, uh, it, it, was, it would become evident in your math. I gave you that point, and then the answer itself was worth three points. <coughs> okay. How y'all doing? The good news about um, I hat, J hat is it's, it's a weird way to write things because you're not used to it, but once you get used to it, it is so much easier and your life will become so much happier. <laughs> you didn't know just vector notation would make you happy, but it does. <laughs> and, uh, okay, there you go. Well, number five. Any questions before I move on to number five? This is one most people know already. In fact, I think it's like part of the state. I don't know. I don't think they let you out of the ninth grade without knowing this. Like I, I don't. Th I think you have. You're required by state law to know this at the end of ninth grade. Although most people forget them and then have to be reminded again. This is the way we all work, right? Our brains don't hold things forever. Anyway, law number one: object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted on by an outside force. That outside being key. Or you can say the same thing another way, an object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted on by an outside force. So both those parts there are the first law. Uh, so I gave you one point for the in motion or the at rest part, and then one point for the outside force part. So there's one point for each of those parts of that first law. The second law is the most used in this class by far. I mean, we use this, this is how we attack every single miserable problem. and you need to know this one. So here it is. And you already know this, but some of the forces equals ma, but don't forget, that's a vector equation. So this is add up all the forces that are outside of your object, that are on your object from the outside, equals the mass of that object times acceleration. You can just write it in equation form, but uh, <coughs> what I did is I put half a point on the summation, one point on the vectors and half a point on the equation. Like if you had F equals MA, that by itself is a half a point, but you don't forget the summation and the vector piece. That's important. And just to put this in perspective, um, I, okay, so step away from the test for a minute. The way physics works 
is you're taught what you can handle. <laughs> There's more. Don't worry. <laughs> What I mean is, we're neglecting all kinds of things. Like, massive pulley, ah, there's no mass there. Massive string, ah, there's no mass there. Friction in the string, ah, don't worry about that. Air friction, ah, forget that. We're just, we're neglecting stuff left and right, okay, all over the place. And, <clears throat> and, and, and right down to Newton's second law, this is, we're neglecting a huge piece here. Okay, here, let me show you what Newton actually wrote, okay? Newton said, some of the forces is equal to the, ma uh, is equal to the time derivative of momentum. That's not MA at all. <laughs> Why are we saying MA? Well, what is momentum? Y'all remember? Momentum is mass times velocity. So let me write that out. Mass times velocity. Okay. If mass changes with time and velocity changes with time, what do you have here? Calculus rule. What do we call that? Yeah, this is a product rule. Do you see that? And so then what this is going to be is some of the forces equals d by dt of mass times v, not derivative, plus d by dt, uh, oh, let me write this better, mass times d by dt of velocity. Do you remember product rule, right? It's just that for now, don't worry, it'll change later. For now, we're just only using examples where mass doesn't change. And if your mass doesn't change, well, then we just throw this whole piece away. And now you get MA. Does that make sense? I'm just telling you, don't worry, there's more coming. <clears throat> when would mass change? Can you think of any examples when mass changes throughout the problem? No, that would change the weight, but not the mass. Although, unless you're talking about the planet itself changing mass, then that would be challenging. Okay, yeah, so there's a truck rolling down a hill and its mass is changing because it's dropping things out the back end. Yeah, uh, how about rockets? This, this is the prime example of mass changing. The, yeah, the Saturn V rocket, you know the one we used to get to the moon? 30 tons of fuel per second. That's astounding, the quantity of mass being lost. You can't throw this piece away when you're talking about that. Okay, you all see what I'm saying? So, anyway, uh, that was a side note. Uh, law number three. I don't know. It's not... Uh, I'd like to say it's not my fault, but it is. Anyway, law number three, back on track. <clears throat> For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You can just quote Newton that way, or you can talk about it in laws of grammar. You know, fist hits chair, therefore, chair hit fist, chair hit fist opposite and equal reaction, okay? <clears throat> and th that one was worth one point. Okay, so it was two points, two points, one point. Rule number six or problem number six. This one, I don't know. I think it's the bane of everybody's existence. My poor 2100 students right now, they're in physics three, and they're doing a lab where they have to keep track of this for 300 data points. If you hear them complaining, that's what they're complaining about right now. <coughs> I think if you listen loud enough, they'll You'll hear it, the complaining. Anyway, here, here's, let's work it out. 1.678 minus 0.8821 plus 0.4433 over 2.3222, okay? Now the, the, the method you wanna do to keep track of sig figs and precision 
is just do it one little baby step at a time. Just do one baby step, rewrite it. One baby step, rewrite it. Every single step, that's the way you do it. So I'm not gonna mess with this and I'm not gonna mess with that. I'm only gonna do that, okay? So now we're gonna have 1.678 minus, uh, and I don't need the parentheses anymore because I'm gonna, actually gonna add them, uh, 1.3 254 over 2.3222. Okay? Now what's the rule with addition? Least precise. Keep the least precise. Okay, so this one is precise to the ten thousandth place, and this one is precise to the ten thousandth place. So what's our answer? Ten thousandths place. Okay, so this one is precise to there. It's not a vector. You can either overline it or underline it. I don't care how you do it, one way or the other. It's just signifying this is where you've measured to. Okay, it's not a vector. It's just a number. A number. Okay. Now we're going to do subtraction. So we're going to subtract that top part. And we're going to have 0.3526 is that subtraction. Now this one is and again subtraction least precise. This one's precise to the thousandths. This one's precise to the ten thousandths. Which one is le least precise? Thousands. So this one is only good to here. But we don't round it off yet. You never round off till you're done. If you round it off here, you'll get it wrong. Now we're going to do division. 2.3222. And when you do that, uh, that quotient, you get 0.151839. <coughs> The rule with division is? Which is very different. The least number of sig figs is very different than the least precise. Okay, so sig figs is what we care about. This has three sig figs. This has five sig figs. Hmm, three is less. So our answer can only have three sig figs. We're only good to there. And now since we're done, now we round it. So our answer, our reported answer is 0 0.152. That's the reported answer. Okay. How y'all doing? Any questions? Okay. <coughs> this one, uh, it was just points on the answer. There you go. It, it's kind of it was possible to do a silly math mistake along the way, and I tried to I tried to keep track of it after that, but it's not always easy. Okay. Any questions on the sig fig rules? Because I mean that gets everybody. But I'm hoping if we do enough simple examples like this, it helps clarify it so that when you get to the harder examples, it'll already be there. Y'all doing all right? Okay. Well, oh no, we're not done. One more. <coughs> Number seven. You've got a car. You must live up north somewhere because you've got your car out on a frozen lake. And uh, Jimbo is pushing the car east. So he's pushing it this way. There's a force of 66 pounds that way, east. Now let me draw the compass rows. North, west, well north and south, and the rest spells we. Say it again. Oh, that, that was outside, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bob, Jimbo and Bob, okay. Bob is pushing it north with a force of 89 newtons. Right off the bat, before you get anywhere else, you say, hey, those units don't match. We better either put this in pounds or that in newtons, one way or the other. <coughs> it's 
it's easier to go to take this one to Newton's because this car is 440 kilograms. And so since this is metric and that's metric, let's just change one of them rather than all three, than the other two. Okay, so if you change that, you gotta do this conversion over here, 66 pounds. And the unit conversion is right on your uh, equation sheet. One pound is 4.45 Newtons. Just as a side note, and I know, I, th I think I've said it before, if I haven't, here it is, but I think I've said it before, but pounds in the English system is force. It's, 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 it's a force. That's when we say I'm 55 pounds, not, <laughs> that, that's my weight pulling me down. That's a weight, not a mass. Over in Europe, they don't, talk about weight. They talk about mass. They measure themselves when they stand on their bathroom scale. They're not finding their weight. They're not finding the force of gravity. They're finding their mass. And it says, my mass is 45, 55 kilos, as in kilograms. Okay, that's a mass. Mass and weight are different beasts. You can't, so, so students say, <coughs> uh, 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 this is a fair game for a test down the road, okay? Convert, 55 kilograms. What is that in pounds? Answer, that's illegal. You can't do that. What are you talking about? This is mass, that's weight. You can't convert mass to weight. Now there's equations, if you know the mass and you know the planet you're on, then you can find the weight, but you can't convert that. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, I know this is hard because you go to the gym and you pick up one of those big 45 pound plates. It says 45 pounds on one side. What does it say on the other side? 22 kilos. I th it converts it on the dumbbell. You see what I'm saying? We do it all the time commonplace, but it's wrong. <laughs> uh, it's just the way it is. We, we're not supposed to be doing that, but we do it all the time. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Yeah, and it's just to help the people from Europe that come over here to lift weights. I don't know why. Maybe, to help, maybe they, it's to help the Americans that go over to Europe to lift weights too. Okay, that's a lot of words. Here we go. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, when you convert this, you get um, 293.7 newtons. So that's the force of Jimbo pushing east. Well, now that you have that, let's write this in vector notation. The net force on the car is 293.7 i-hat plus 89 j-hat newtons. See that? This one's going in the x, this one's going in the y. Vector. But Newton says that the sum of the forces equals ma. As long as your car doesn't change mass, which it's not, so we'll just stick with that. So you can get A real easy, just divide M over here. So A vector is going to be 293.7 I hat plus 89 J hat Newtons divided by 440 kilograms. And the rules of algebra apply. So if you've got this in the denominator and you've got two things in the numerator, well that 440 has to go here and here. It goes both places. And so you end up getting <coughs> 0.668 i-hat plus 0.202 j-hat meters per second squared. And that's your answer. How y'all doing? I think this is one of those problems that's really easy, unless you don't see the trick. <laughs> if you don't see the trick, all of a sudden you get swallowed up in this 
abyss of circles that you get, logic circles that you get stuck in. Um, <coughs> any questions on it now that you see how to do it? No? Okay. Will it matter which conversion factor we use since there's two for pounds to newtons on here? They should both get, get take you to the same place. That's slightly different number, but okay. it's still kind of different. So. Uh, what was the other one? Um, Is, was it the flip of this? Like one newton to so-and-so pounds? Yeah. Yeah, the, tomato, tomato. It might be off by one decimal yeah, place or something. Decimal, but um, okay. Yeah, it, and, and then you have to apply sig fig rules. So I'm not doing sig figs, but if it was a lab, you'd say, well, I've only got two sig figs here. So it's only good to there. And yeah, so we can only report 290. So if you're off by one decimal place, they both get the same answer. So within sig figs, they are both correct. Oh, where's the points? Um, this one I only gave, I gave points. If you knew F equals MA, I gave you three points. F equals MA. And I gave you two points if you knew you had to do a unit conversion. And you did it right. And then it was all down here. So one point for the general format. Um, <coughs> one point for the I hat and the J hat. Uh, and how did I do that? Oh, one point for the units. And one point. Oh, that's, that's it. Okay, so there's one point for the answer and the I hat, and one point for the answer and the J hat. There we go. Okay, 10 points total. Well, that's the test. Say it again. One, two, three, four. That's only nine points. I have another point written over there. It might be for the dividing by 440. Right there, it's kind of written between the two. I think it's for the 440. Well, we left off uh, working on that problem with the two discs or two masses going on the table, and I don't think we finished that one. So we had a, uh, a tabletop with two a rope with two masses on it. And they're just spinning around. And I forget the details of the problem. What do y'all have written down here? Oh, okay, so it gives you period, yeah. and it's tau, and what else does it give you? Oh, it's just like L1 and L2 or something? Yeah, L1 and L2 and L2. 
L1, L2, M1, M2. And it wants the tension one and tension two, is that right? Tension one, tension two. Okay, so y'all have been at this enough that you should be able to do that one on your own. But tell me, we'll work it together, but you tell me how to do it. So where do we start? Where do we start everything, right? F equals MA. Sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And we're just going to work in the direction towards the middle. Okay, what'd you say? We started on M1. Okay, and we want to start on M1. Okay, so, so what are the forces on M1? Okay, we've got normal going up. We've got gravity going down. And we've got T2 and T1. So do we, what do we care about here? Do we care about up and down? Or do we care in and out? You see what I'm saying? Towards the middle and away from the middle. That's the one we care about. Because that's where the tension is. Uh, so our, our normal force and gravity, they're just going to add up to zero. They're not going to affect anything. Let's just ignore them. Because we're not, because remember this is a vector equation. So really we should split this up into the sum of the forces y equals m a y and sum of the forces, um, let's call it r, radial direction, mass times acceleration in the radial direction going in and out. Okay? But this one, if we do this, what's this going to tell us? This is, this is going to just tell us normal force equals mg. And you say, great, thank you, I don't need that. And so it's not that this is wrong, it's just not helpful. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so now that we've done that, let's go over here and let's do this one. What are the forces in the away from middle and towards the middle direction? T1, T2. Okay. T1, T2. Which way is positive and which way is negative? By the way, it doesn't matter. You just got to pick something and stick to it. We said out is positive. Okay, so then in is negative, so then this would be negative. This would be positive. Equals mass times acceleration. Is this thing accelerating? What do we call that? And is that towards the center or away from the center? Which would make it positive or negative? Negative. Does that make sense to everybody? Because we said towards the center is negative. So this is going to be negative um, v squared over r. <coughs> well, can we, oh, do we have V? No. Well, all we have is time to go once around. Can we get V? How do you get V? We're talking about speed here. Equation sheet, number one. What's speed? Yeah, it's just distance over time, right? And, and I'm just going to write, since I'm doing speed and not velocity, I'm just going to do distance over time. What's the distance around this loop? Uh, yeah, the, the time to go once around is the period. The distance to go once around is the circumference. And what did you say that was? Yeah, 2 pi r, right? It's just that r is L1. So it's 2 pi L1 over the time to do once around is the period. Hey, we can plug that in right over there. So now we've got minus T1 plus T2 equals minus M over r times 2 pi L1, oops, L1 over the period squared. <coughs> Did I miss? Oh, I put the R over here. Y'all okay with that? In this equation, what don't we know?
We don't know T1. We don't know T2. So how many unknowns do we have? How many equations do we have? What does that mean? We need another equation. Where are we going to go? The other mass. So let's, go, let's do some of the forces on this object now. Okay, so this was on M1. Now let's do on M2. We'll do some of the forces equals MA. Now, we need to, this is a vector, so we need to split it up into the X and the Y, or the radial and the Y. Are we gonna do, which one are we going to do in Y? That's... Yeah, the Y thing is just going to tell us this again. Do we care? No, so I'm not even going to mess with it. I'm just going to go straight to the radial direction, okay? So this is just R. Okay, so looking at... I'll, I'll have to use a different color. This is my green over there. What are the forces on M2 in the radial direction? Just T2. Now, is it pulling it out? It's pulling it in. Because it's, it's attached. Now, this rope is attached both places. So, notice T2 pulls M2 that way, even though it pulls M1 that way. But that's normal, because that's what ropes do. If, if Xavier and I were in a tug of war, pretend with me, we're, we're doing a tug of war, it's going to pull me that way, but it's going to pull him this way, because ropes always pull in two directions. That's what, this is what ropes do. Okay? So, is that, and I think that's it. There's nothing else there, right? There's normal force and gravity, but we're not doing those directions, so there we go. Okay, so we're going to have T2, is that going to be positive or negative? Negative. Equals M2 times acceleration. What's the acceleration? Centripetal acceleration, V squared over R. Is that going to be positive or negative? Negative. So we have negative T2 equals negative M2 times, and we'll use that same equation again, 2 pi over period. Should I put L1 or L2? L1 plus L2. See how you got to have the radius there? 2 pi r, but r is L1 plus L2. Yes. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> they have mass, just no size. <laughs> but you're right, if this were a real experiment, we'd need to take that size into account. Okay. Y'all doing all right? Well, guess what? We can cancel out the negative sign, and there's our answer for T2. It's already done for us. And you're like, but there's no numbers. Yeah, that's it. R is given. Oh, wait, what, what's R? I should have written that out. So we can simplify this. L1 plus L2, put that there. Now, that square needs to go into all these pieces. Everything inside there gets squared. So let me write this out. T2 is going to be equal to M2 over L1 plus L2 times 4 pi squared L1 plus L2 squared over period squared. And then we can simplify this ever so slightly. You all see the simplification? Yeah, there's, a, there's an L1 plus L2 downstairs and a square upstairs. <coughs> now we have T2. What are we going to do with it? Plug it in back here. Uh, and, and what's this radius on this first equation? When we're talking about M1, what's that radius? L1. So um, let's write all that out. <coughs> negative T1 plus T2, which is that, M2 4 pi squared 
L1 plus L2 not squared all over period squared equals negative M over L1, that's M1, times 4 pi squared L1 squared period squared. And I'll just get rid of those parentheses. Mm-hmm, we can simplify this. It's L1 downstairs and the square upstairs. Just one of those squares. And what are we looking for? T1. T1, so to get T1, what are we gonna do? Yeah, Generally, we feel happier when we make things positive. I don't know what it is. Is I don't know. My belly just feels happier when I do that. So I like to add this to the other side just so it's positive, and then add that to the other side so everything's away from it. You don't have to do it that way. You could leave it there and subtract this over here, and then everything will be negative, and all your negatives will go away. One way or the other, you end up with everything positive and T by itself. Does that make sense to everybody? So let me rewrite that. I'll use this space over here. So I'll use purple. So now we're going to have T1 is equal to, hmm, let me give myself a little more space. T1 is equal to uh, <coughs> M1, 4 pi squared, L1 over period squared plus M2, 4 pi squared, L1 plus L2 over period squared. Can that be simplified? Yeah, we can simplify a lot there, can't we? How about we take every, all the 4 pi squared and period squared just right out front? Just factor it out. Undistribute it. Okay, so we're going to have... <coughs> 4 pi squared over period squared times M1 L1 plus M2 L1 plus L2. There we go. That's T1. And I don't think you can simplify that anymore. That's about as good as it gets. There we go. There's our two answers. What's T1? All that. What's T2? All that, all done. How y'all doing? Y'all are quiet today. <sighs> Christopher, what was your favorite picture at the Art, art exhibit? Um, probably the nebula. I agree. Either that or the seahorses. Yeah. I like seeing those up close. Wetzel took the seahorse pictures. He's just a biology, he's one of the guys right over here, biology professor. Something I was curious of. In one of the microscopes, there was a little uh, spherical. Thing. Oh, yeah? Like it had eyes. Oh. I'm not sure. I'm just curious what that was. I didn't look in the microscopes. I don't know. I didn't get to see there. Yeah. He would enjoy that. <laughs> okay. I, the nebula picture is a beautiful picture. Whoever took that picture invested hours and hours just getting the picture. And then probably another set of hours making it look as good as it did. Okay, well, we've got 40 seconds, so I'll let you go early today. How's that? By 40 seconds, isn't that early? <laughs> okay, uh, and then we haven't started the next chapter yet.
So you don't have a quiz up this weekend. You don't have homework this weekend. I don't know what you're going to do with yourselves. You're going to be bored out of your mind, wishing you had physics to do, I'm sure. Just sitting around, oh, I wish I had some physics to occupy my time with. <laughs>